I think anytime I get on a plane for a gig, it's, it's, I think like, this is the life. There is nothing like being a guest artist. There's nothing like it going somewhere else and performing and having people like expecting you, waiting for you and like hoping for your show. Like there's nothing like that. There, there's nothing like that. And any time I just want to do that more and more. And it, and it's, you know, it's, it's just so, it's so powerful when it all works out. On this episode of Establish Your Empire, I host Lauren Lodrudice. Lauren creates comedy through deeply flawed and painfully idiosyncratic characters. She has embodied some of the world's most mysterious cultural icons and her work has been featured by the New York Times, the BBC, and many others. In this episode, we chat about how to make it as a comedian, how to market yourself online, and how she wrote her new book, Inside Melania, What I Learned About Melania Trump by Impersonating Her. Probably my favorite review is by Rich Scheidner. Lauren masterfully used satire, parody, and irony to process the Slovenian ice queen. <laughs> Listeners of this podcast can get the first three chapters of her audiobook free by visiting laurenlugi.com slash empire. You're listening to the Establishing Your Empire show, a podcast that inspires entrepreneurs, creatives, and future business owners to pursue their passions, grow their organizations, and build their empire. My name is Darren Herman, and creatively, I'm best known for my photography. But business-wise, my claim to fame is growing a company from 15K per month in online sales to breaking the $1 million a month barrier. And I'm sitting down with interesting people to talk about their process, the lessons they've learned, and how they have established their empires. All right. I got Lauren here on the Establishing Your Empire podcast. Why don't you give us a little background and information of who you are and what you do? Great. Yes. So I create comedy through characters and I try to help us all uh, laugh about what's hard in the world. So uh, I've taken people that are a lot of them are misunderstood and, and try to help create some understanding between myself, them and hopefully the audience. That's super fun. So why, why characters instead of just, you know, stand up comedy or, you know, it's, it's like something that just, you realize something you're really good at. That's one of the, that's why I started to focus on it as, as a business strategy. Uh, is this, you realize like, finally, like, like I was talking to a booker and he said, you know, I need to find a show where I can put you on and you can come and do your characters. And I was like, no, no, I could do my stand up, my regular stand up. He's like, yeah, but yeah, no one else does that though. No one else has your characters. You're the only one. And I'm like, ah, oh. yeah, it's <laughs> awesome. something to that. And was that something that you did like as a kid a bunch? Like, did you always inter- impersonate people and make jokes and mm-hmm. stuff like that? Well, you know, when I was a kid, I was, I was a little bit shy and very sensitive, but I was an outsider and I don't look like anyone in my neighborhood. So I'm tall and fair and everyone in my neighborhood were short little Italian people. Uh, I grew up in Howard Beach in Queens, uh, which is like the set of The Sopranos. And, and so, and even in my family, so I don't look like anyone and I, oh, I'm really tall and skinny. And I was able to have an outsider perspective and I would watch about, I never felt like I was part of them. And so, so I would watch how people would treat each other and had that outsider view. And when I started creating one of the first things that I thought about was doing a character. And I was attracted to any sort of art form that required a character development. And I started to use the experiences of watching how people treated each other growing up. And some of my first characters were all basically based on my family from that. Oh, I love that. <laughs> so how, how did you go from, all right, you know, get going through high school, doing all that, and then actually getting into comedy? Like, was it something where it was really easy and you got paid for your first gig really quickly? Or like, how did you actually make it into even thinking about it being a career? Well, I didn't grow up in a family that thought that anything but getting a job with a pension benefits, you know, 
could ever work. So I actually, I went to Wesleyan University, one of the most progressive schools in the country. And I was, in my mind, it was like, they didn't really ever tell me like, you're not allowed to. I just knew that they would never approve of me doing anything but science, because why would I do anything that didn't have a practical application? Like, what do you do? You major in English and then you just become a teacher. Like, what do you, good job do you get? So I didn't, I didn't understand that that's not how it works. You learn how to think and then you can do anything. Didn't, that was not sold in my family. They were like, but what job, like what job do you get from that? So then I, so I majored in science and what ended up happening? I became a teacher. So I was a teacher for three years and like, I never thought, just never thought it was possible. And I had to work through like a lot of emotional things before I could get on the stage again. When I was a kid, I was, I was dancing and performing and, um, you know, locally. And it was always something I love to do, but I never thought like I it could do anything. And then just, you know, growing up being so different, coming out in college, I had so much, and so, so much family drama. I wasn't ready to be on the stage again. So it wasn't until I became a teacher, I moved away, um, became, and then I was there for three years in California and I started to perform on like performance art type stages, drag stages and other places. And I was creating these characters and i really loved it, but I loved it in a way that not everyone around me did like to them, it was a hobby. And to me, it was a calling. And that's when I knew like, all right, like I have to do something with this, but I didn't know what it would mean. And, and no idea. And like Steve Martin says something to the effect of when I decided to become, get into show business is it was because I know nothing about show business. <laughs> and that's why I said, yes. So that's <laughs> went into it head first. And then I like, wasn't sure what I was going to do. And then I got a fellowship to go to India for a year. And, and while I was there, I was basically like, if I don't do what I love to do, then I'm wasting my life. I have this opportunity. I'm lucky to be able to have the education in the background to be able to, to do a little bit of what I wanted. Cause once I was a teacher, I knew I could tutor. I had like an income stream kind of that I can back myself up with. So, and I'm so glad I was miserable, like miserable majoring in science, but yet now I'm not afraid of a spreadsheet and I can always tutor chemistry. So that was like, when I came back to New York, that was something I knew that I could do. So now I'm in New York and I knew no one, like no one in show business. I'm from Queens, Howard Beach, you know, I'm like so, so near, so far from the city. So it's like, it's like a million miles away. Like people like go to Broadway once a year. So there was no sort like a path for me at all, no welcome mat. And so what I did is I knew one person and then I talked to that person and I said, like, this is what I want to do. I want to get, be a performer professionally. I don't know what it would mean. And then that person introduced me to someone else. And then that person introduced me to something else, someone else. And that's really how it goes. I like, I have friends from back in the neighborhood. They're like, we have no idea how you know all these people. And it's like, well, I didn't know anyone either. I just started that's, and you just show up to things. You go to events, you, you, I hate the word network, but as you get to know people and you build relationships and you foster those relationships and you keep track of those relationships, very important. And you just like kind of grow them over the years. Cause the main thing is, is especially in show business is that people, everyone's a flake. There's so many flakes. There's so many people I want to like try to do acting and, or I want to be, I want to write a screenplay. I want to do comedy. Yeah. What have you done? You know, and, and they, they get discouraged after, you know, two, two months or two years and then they leave. Like there's that scene in the Sopranos where what's his, Christopher, Christopher is like, he buys like a laptop and screenplay software. And he's like, I don't know. I just can't write. I just, I, I bought it. I thought it would write. And it's like, yeah, well, this comes the, the, the really intense inner work to do um, what you're supposed to do. And this is like, I mean, for any real, any sort of career, any sort of, if you're an entrepreneur, whatever you're doing, like, okay, you want to do it, but now comes the grinding. Now comes the rejection. Now comes the like feeling like you fail every single day. T her hearing you suck every single day. Like, it's not 
easy. And that's what separates the people who can do something different with the people who, who can. They yeah. And let's talk about the grind. Yeah. yeah. Let's talk about the grind a little bit because, so I own a photo video company too. So I know that what you're talking about, a lot of models that want to be a model or photographers that want to be photographers, but they just get the, they spend all this money on the camera and then they just think that's enough. Like I got a $6,000 camera, you know, uh, and I had, have this little art piece that I made and then it's like, what else have you done? So let's go back. So what, one of in New York, like how was your first, you know, your first, um, I don't know, stand up comedy or production piece. Like, t- tell us about that kind of journey from then to now a little bit more in like how you decided to go in dif- the direction you're going in or however you want to take it. I just kind of want to talk about the grind a little bit. And I'm not, not sure what my question yeah. is there, but uh, well, yeah, the main thing is like getting like so many performers. Um, I spoke to so many people um, just by asking like, hey, can I have a few minutes of your time to talk about your journey? Taylor Mack was someone I spoke on the phone with, just happened to know someone who knew him. He's he's an incredible theater artist in New York. And was like, how did you get started? And they're like, I just jumped on every single stage that I could. That's always the thing. And that's what I did. And I jump, I've jumped on a lot of stages all over the place um, in whatever I was doing, just trying to, to put my work out there and to get better at it. So, I mean, I've done like, I did a play in this experimental theater in <laughs> Hell's Kitchen. Like that was good, but it got me a New York Times write up. So like things like that, you know, you never know. You never, like this theater, oh my God, I would have never thought this crazy show, this like Jean Genet play. And then this, I would have never thought that did and would do anything for me. And it, and it led to something that did. So that, you know, you just never know what's going to happen. Yeah. And getting those reps in, I think is really big and no, in, in, in any industry, like getting just reps and reps and reps. Yeah, absolutely. And when I was, um, working on stand up, so I kind of was, you know, figuring out, I was doing solo plays and the director was like, it seems like you just want to talk to the audience. And I was like, yeah, I think I do. And then someone brought me to a stand up show and I was like, or stand up open mic. And I was like, Oh, <gasps> this is it. Oh my God. I found it. (laughs) This is the thing. And like so many people in comedy, it's just like, you know, you want to make your voice heard. But to me, stand up was never an option because in comedy in general, because I would go to like a stand up show and it would be a straight white guy standing on stage, making fun of everyone who he felt was beneath him. And so like, every, you know, he's just making misogynistic, racist, sexist, Joe, homophobic jokes. And I'm like, I don't, I never felt like I could be the one to do it. It never made me feel great to go to a comedy show. And then I realized that there's all these other comedians who are outside the mainstream and do well and create comedy that unites rather than divides and makes people feel great in, in the best way. So it took me a while to get there because a lot of comedians don't realize that we, it's an option that we, that we can do it. So when I finally got there, I used the same strategy, which is just like jump on any stage. So I was actually performing like (laughs) Cranberry, New Jersey. like. And then, and like hated, like so hated by so many people and like these middle of nowhere places. But I was advised by some senior comedians, get away from the fray. Don't, don't do stuff like in New York because then people have already seen you. And you know what, when I was, um, focusing a little more on acting when I was just starting out, I wish I would have done that. I wish I would have, cause then people feel like they already know you. I wish I would have gotten my sea leg somewhere else to be honest, and then come back and kind of knew exactly what I was doing and, and what I stood for and what I wanted because it's first impressions are a lot. And so I wish I would have kind of, you know, there is that like one person who doesn't know what they're doing and somehow falls into a career. And I think that is just few and far between. And I think I like worked my way up and was able to, and like still act and like got myself to understand the industry. But I just feel like it's quicker if you just, you're ready to go. And Mm -hmm. that's um, what I was doing with comedy. I was hiding from the city. And just as I was about to like start to do more stuff within New York, um, that's when I fell into doing stand up as Melania Trump. And that was like a joke I did at a comedy club in uh, Parks Casino. And it was a joke about Melania Trump 
looking miserable. Like she's, uh, that reminds me of Melania. I saw a picture and I was like, oh my God, it reminds me of Melania Trump. I'm, I'm, I, I, I remind myself, I saw a picture of myself and it reminds me of Melania Trump because she's miserable, but trying. Um, <laughs> And that was the time. <laughs> um, and I came off the stage and the booker was like, you got to do an impression. And um, I was like, oh, man, I don't, I do, I do like original characters. I don't do, I don't do impressions. And then uh, I did it a few videos and I was like, all right, that's it. But it did well. And then someone asked me to do a Halloween show and that, and I did stand up as her and it went really well. <sighs> And then I, I created an Instagram channel and that started, it's just like things kept happening as well. And then I wrote a book um, and that kind of led me to where I am. So I guess to summarize, it's been like just putting one foot in front of the other and having like a greater goal of like what I want to do in the world and just trusting that I'll somehow get there, <laughs> you know, just by, I would have never predicted this Melania thing ever, ever. Yeah. So how, how did, so that's great that, that somebody else kind of gave you that first push to create that character, but how do you actually get into character, right? Yeah. Mentally, like, how do you, how does that work? Yes. Well, it's <laughs> my process. It's hard to know, you know, like, like, like Meryl Streep says, like, you, you don't want to tell all the secrets you'll ruin the fun and the magic maybe. So, um, I use a few different techniques that I've learned over the years. Um, one thing I've had to, to fight against is that I'm like a very physical actor and like, you know, someone who likes to kind of put on the costume first, if I guess if I had to describe it. And there's a lot of poo-pooing of that in the um, in the in the acting world. So I had to like kind of overcome teachers who would make me feel bad for that. Then that's something like I think when you go into anything, you have people who like shit on what your natural instincts are. <laughs> and it's like you, I was talking to someone the other day, like when you get into acting training, you know, you have certain instincts. And I wonder if this is the same for people feel this way for business school, but you have instincts that, and this made you, made you want to go into to what you were doing. And then they go there and they try to sell you a formula that they say is the way to do it. And then you have to get through that have them almost demolish your spirit, but remember it. Remember what the original spirit was and fight through that spirit and then come out on the other side where you have that initial spark, but yet you have more technique and knowledge behind you. And, and I think that's beautifully put. The big thing is, is if you do exactly what all the teachers tell you to do, you're just going to be normal, but you still need the technique. You need the reps. So there's still value there, but you, I do believe that you have to go off on your own path. Otherwise... Again, you're just going to be the same person, same same actor, same yeah, comedian, absolutely. photographer, business person down on down the road. Um, absolutely. So let's talk about the Melania character a little bit. Um, so I, I, tell me, maybe let's go actually um, the marketing side of it first. Um, social media, offline, online. What's kind of your approach to marketing with before even before the book and all that? Like, how did how did you kind of come up with getting this out there? And yeah. Popular. So, uh, so much. I mean, one thing is, um, to be consistent in creating online content. So how do you do that when uh, you're trying to perform and write for the stage and stand up stage and do a million other things? And the secret is batch filming. I will not shoot less than 10 videos in a day. And now we're doing TikTok, forget it. We're just doing it. You could do a zillion videos in a day. And it, cause you find the theme that you're working on and you just, you literally like create for that theme and you make repeatable videos you can do over and over. And you'd be surprised how many work, like I'm releasing videos I shot two years ago. And the post production just took that long, but I kept it on theme. Like people don't change. Let me tell you, like uh, some of these themes from Melania, like just as relevant, just as applicable. <laughs> so batch creating video has been super essential. So that was one thing so that I could be consistent. You really need to be consistent on social media. That's, that's a big deal. Um, I also look, look to Acadium. That's been very, very helpful as of late. 
Acadium is a great place to match you up with an apprentice. Um, and it's been, since I was a teacher, I have skills in mentoring. And so I get these really, really great people who help me just with like scheduling YouTube videos, looking up keywords, doing the thumbnails, because it is too much. It is too much. There is too much. And there's ways to get help. And I think at a certain point you have to be like, I'm either going to not sleep or I'm, I'm going to get help. So that's, an, that's another way. Cause then you start to create all the stuff and now you need to distribute all the stuff. And also I'm creating other stuff as well. So that's, that's been kind of the mechanisms as which I've kind of kept this, this basically like assembly line for online video going. Then, it's you know, so, it's so yeah. interesting. Sorry to cut you off there, but this is what's great about podcasts is I get to talk to people with all different walks of life and they, it's all the same story. You know, create a ton of content, batch process it, get some freelancers or some employees to help you and be consistent and continue, keep going because it's not going to, it's not going to all happen in one day and one week. It's going to be over a period of time. And if you keep creating that content, yeah, that, that'll, that'll I, help. I feel like I've weighed people down with the enormity of my message until they fucking listen to me. That's how <laughs> I've done it. I've not, no, because no one, guess what? Because no one wants to listen to you and no one cares about you. And you have to force, and there are so many people out there with so many advantages of who they know, who their father knows. They happen to get on a television show and they have an advantage and don't fucking hesitate for a goddamn second about any, any little trick you can do to get ahead because, because everyone else is. And so you got to too, you have to do whatever you have to do to get it out there. And like, you know, also the other thing, like there's a great, of course, I'm sure you've all heard this, that Gary Vaynerchuk, like, you know, 63 con pieces of content in a day or whatever it is, 36, whatever it is, a lot of content in a day. And I think like looking at like repurposing content, that's a big deal, you know, like, cause the other thing is no one sees anything, no one reads, no one hears, understands, cares. So like, so what I say about that is like, I put out a one minute video. Well, I could take a clip of that a 10 second clip and put it up six months or a year from now because no one remembers. No one's going to remember that one minute video. And if they do, oh my God, what a fan, sell them something, please. Like no one's going to remember. And then you can also start if you have a longer video, you can turn that into a medium article. Um, just start thinking of like all the different ways you can like bring messages from one form to the other because no one is no one will remember and people need to hear it multiple times in order for them to get it. Um, and like, you know, if you like, if I write a really great joke, that's 30 seconds in, I know most people aren't going to see that. And it's like giving, like respecting your work. Like you wrote a good joke. I like wrote the joke, rehearsed the joke, filmed the joke, like edited the joke, like did some post-production on the joke. Like I got to give the joke life. Like you have to respect your work. And that's, you know, even like with podcasting, that's something like in the last year I've been working on my podcast and I realized like, I'm not even maximizing that. Like there's so much, like I should be sending clips to people who've been on the podcast. Like I should be finding more ways to put clips that I have of stuff that I've done on my podcast. I mean, there's so much, and I should be like writing more about the experience of having the podcast and what I'm learning and like just kind of extrapolating like what I, what I have. So I'm actually taking a few months break so that I can just start to catch up with that and maybe even publish less often so I can do more with what I have. Cause sometimes it's not about like doing more. It's just doing less, but more with what you have. And I agree with that. And I love a lot, of, a lot of that, what you said there. What about the problem with perfection? How do you actually push your stuff out there? Have you had any problems with that of actually releasing this stuff on social media? And, and how do you deal with that if you do have any problems? One thing is, for instance, some of my videos are like beautifully produced and they take so much time in post-production. And then I see people with videos that take a 10th of the, of the, um, time and get a lot more views. So my philosophy, I'm like, okay, I can get mad or I could just take it as a learning lesson and say like the, and it all comes in the conception of, of what, of what your, of what your plan is. And so if that is wrong, if my, if my, like, conception is to create these perfect videos that are going to have all these extra steps. I've just made created problems for myself. So I got to keep it small 
and which you can't screw up. Okay. So this is like, for instance, I'm working on a new video. These, these batch of videos, I'm going to do 10 videos at least in this day. And I have the setting and I have, I just have to set up the lights once and I can bang out a bunch of one. It's with, I'm doing an Ivanka impression now. So it's going to like be Ivanka, (laughs) Ivanka giving her favorite quotes. And (laughs) so, um, but the thing is, it needs no background popped in on green screen. It's only 20 seconds and I will only do it in one take. Meaning I will only do like the take that's best. I won't have to cut it in between. And so that will take maybe like 20 minutes to edit. Like, so I've, I see what I mean. I've like made it easier for me. Cause then if you need more steps, this is where perfectionism comes in. It needs to be, it needs to be this elaborate production with all of these things. And then it's going to, you're creating the problems and then it's going to get screwed up because your concept was too complex like this is a, a do you need quality and quantity? Yes. But you have to think about how to create quality that's easy. Because that's where you're gonna get screwed up. And like then you like and especially like when you make it more complicated, more things can get screwed up. And that's where it comes in. Now, a lot of times when you think and like some people I work with who I love dearly and do incredible work for me, but then it's like more complicated for them and I can't get it out of their hands because they're like trying to adjust this and that. And so um, I think part of the problem with perfection is you set yourself up to be a perfectionist. I I love a lot of that. Uh, I also think that, you know, content is what's most important. So if if creating that content, meaning getting a higher production and all that takes away from the actual message or the joke for in, in, in your case, then I think you're ruining it. You're kind of going backwards. And um, I see this a lot in the photo video world where, and I do it myself. I have to, I always have to t- take myself a step back. It doesn't always have to be this perfectly produced item. It just has to be interesting, you know, uh, make somebody think or, or maybe just the background's really cool that you're at. It could still be shot with a phone. You know, it doesn't have to be with my big camera and a drone and 14 different edits, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so let's talk about writing. Um, how did you decide to do a book first and foremost? Like, how did that even thought come <sighs> up in your head? Well, I got a suggestion from Alex LeMay, who's a great mentor. And he was like, you got to write a book. And I was cause he, he pushed me to be like, all right, so you got to just be Lauren. I'm Lauren and I have characters. Like that's the way to do this. And so, I mean, I guess I, the theme throughout this is like, you got to listen to good suggestions from people who know what they're doing because you don't know what you're doing. And like, they have to like feel right for you. Cause I've gotten the wrong suggestions and I, they haven't felt right. And I followed them to dead ends. So I think it's really important to like, feel like what feels good. And it was really scary. The idea of writing a book, but it felt thrilling. And I thought about what I'd, and I thought people do ask me, what is it like to be Melania? And, and I did, people also also ask me that when I was doing a Greta Garbo show and I was like, I do kind of know you do get these like insights into a character by being them. And so that's what (laughs) <laughs> so that's why I started this whole inside Melania thing, because it was like, I do actually like all of the stuff that's coming out about her. I knew already. I'm like, I guess why I put out an article that said, I, Melania Trump is an asshole. I told you so because <laughs> I didn't need tapes. I slipped right inside her. Yes. I didn't intend to this be a dirty joke, by the way, the, the, the title of my book, it just, someone pointed that out on Twitter. And then I was like, now I'm going to use it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> but, um, so I started, I locked myself up in a, in a hotel room in Key West. My partner was going down there and we had a hotel room and I was like, let me see if I can write a book. And I was doing some shows down there, which was super fun. So I did some shows at night and wrote during the day. And then at the end of it, I was like, oh, I think I might have a little book here. And I thought it would be like a, like a small little book. And then, <laughs> and it was mostly like me telling you what I know by impersonating. Then I had some ideas for comedy pieces. And people were like, those are really fun. Can you write more of those? When I had a few people read, read it. And so I write more, more of them. And then I teamed up with Eckhart's Press to publish it. And they were like, how about even more of them? <laughs> so then even more of them, which meant more research, more work, all of that. But it was a great experience. 
Um, and so that is, that is basically how it came to be. And I knew it was timely and I knew it was important because it was giving insight into someone that no one, um, seems to understand, um, and kind of giving you a full free through 360 view from like everything I kind of know and have learned. Yeah. And also making you laugh. Any so it's like a split between hysterical rants and then just humor essays. Yeah. And then any, any, any tips or tricks to writing in general, whether it's for the book or for just writing jokes, your stand up and any, anything there. Write every day. People. Yeah. Write every day, create a list of tasks and do them. Don't get hung up in research. Um, research is important, essential. It drives me nuts when people don't do it because you can tell, but you need to like put the research away and just write at some point. Um, get a community of people around you. There's so many feedback groups on Facebook. You got to be careful because you want to know who you're getting feedback from and that can really be hard, but start to find, there are better Facebook groups. There's one that I'm part of and it's really great. And if you want to be part of it, um, DM me and I can invite you because it's like a private one. So, um, you know, there's ones that are better than others and you can get really good feedback. I took a class that was helpful, um, because it's deadlines and it's a community and actually that the group of people in that class continue to meet. So that's more deadlines, more feedback from people I trust. Um, and so it's ma a matter of just like taking time every day to do it and, and whatever you can do. The other thing is when you're writing a book is that you should understand it's actually a significant part of your day. Um, it would take me two to three hours of writing a day at least. And I thought, this is no big deal. I could keep everything else going on in my life. <laughs> um, that was really hard. I was a shitty friend, a shitty partner, a shitty person. But <laughs> next time I might still be a shitty human, but I will let everyone know first. Like, the next three months, I'm, you're not really going to see me. I'm going to be always kind of stressed out. Um, but I'm writing a book, so just be prepared. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. You, you mentioned um, some mentor uh, beforehand. Um, any mentors that be, <clears throat> maybe could just tell a little bit more story about your mentor or any mentorships that has helped you along your way? Um, along your oh, path? There's, so many, there's so many wonderful people that have helped me. Um, well, one person that like took interest early in my career, well, a few people like took interest early in my career and that really, um, spurred me on. Um, one is Kate Bornstein, who is just a queer idol and an idol in the queer world. And she was so sweet. I was her, like, I was her house sitter and she was just so sweet. She came to my show. She wrote a review for me. She introduced me to people. Um, like I can't, I can't just having someone like her just admire what I was doing and support me was just made a big difference. And that just makes a big, like you really can help young people by just being interested in what they're doing. The another person is, um, okay. So this is a story. So, <laughs> so I had, a, I was like, I'm going to get on the L word. I'm a queer actor. Like I'm going to be on the L word. This is when it was the first rendition of the L word. And I looked up who cast the L word and I saw Pat McCorkle and I called Pat McCorkle and I was like, I want to be your intern. And she was just that day someone had quit. So they called me in and I said, I can only do this like twice or three times a week. And they were like, okay. And they said to me, Pat never does this for anyone. Like she does not do this. Then I like had happened to get into bus magazine and I like brought it in. I had like a full page picture and I was like, Oh yeah, look at like one of my characters is in bust. Just like put it there. And she was like, Oh shit. And then she brought, um, she brought a bunch of the whole office to see my solo show in, uh, in the back of Stonewall Inn. <laughs> it's like a shitty gay bar in an infamous, of course, the famous, the famous Stonewall bar. But it's, you know, not Broadway, which is what Pat, that's her caliber. And, and she came and she brought the whole office and she wrote a review for me for it. Now, the thing that like she really, two thing, pieces of advice, and she was more of like, for her, it was like the support and the actions like gave me such like a lot of confidence. And, you know, she tried to introduce me to people with, to people and that, and that helped. But she gave, told me two things is one, I didn't know what, what pal Joey was. And she was like, Phew. 
that was like, you know, the, the first da, 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 da. and she told me what it was in like a few tear sentences and then walked out. And I was like, I got to know my history. I got to know you can't be in this business and not know like who came before you. Pal Joey was a Broadway play, by the way, musical. <laughs> so the next, and so that really spurred me into like really taking seriously, like learning my history of the business. And the second thing, because people aren't, people, serious people aren't going to take you seriously unless you take this serious. So the next thing is that I finished doing my solo play. I went to like Stockholm, Sweden to perform and came back and I had some meetings, but nothing like um, super crazy came out of the meetings, which is like life. This is how it goes, right? The meetings and meetings. And I was like, Pat, what do I do? Like, I felt so like, you know, a, a boat. To, I was not used to this experience. That's just like, I felt like, oh my God, I'm a boat adrift. What do I do? And she was like, well, no, just keep doing it. This is, <laughs> this is how it goes. <laughs> this is it. <laughs> just keep <Right>. doing it. <laughs> just keep paddling. Yeah. And I'll never, I'll never forget that. I'll never, I'll never forget that. And she just, when I put out my book, she sent me an email and she just said, I'm, I'm just so proud of you. And for the woman, awesome. she did discover Matt Damon. I was like, well, that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Pat is Nets, no joke. Yeah. 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 That's amazing. So. so what's one of the craziest or most memorable things during this, during your career? Um, most memorable. I think anytime I get on a plane for a gig, mm -hmm. it's, it's, I think like, this is the life. I just didn't I love like, that. Yeah. <laughs> There is nothing like being a guest artist. There's nothing like it. Going somewhere else and performing and having people like expecting you, waiting for you and like hoping for your show. Like there's nothing like that. There, there's nothing like that. And any time, I just want to do that more and more because it's so, and, it, and it's, you know, it's, it's just so, it's so powerful when it all works out. So what does uh, success look like for you? Like, how do you? How do you know when you've made it or uh, what you want to be at? Or uh, <laughs> It's a really hard question to answer. And one that I'm actually struggling with right now. I mean, you can, in this business, you can always feel like a failure. And I guess this is true in any business because you can always think, well, I don't have as much as that person. No matter what. I mean, when I think back to like who I was or where I came up, grew up with, like, I am a success. Like, of course, because I'm a working artist like that is a success in itself. Like I've already beaten the odds that I'm still doing this. Like most people, like I run into people and like, again, most people quit. And even the people who are serious, they run out of steam at some point. And some people just have to quit for, because it's hard financially. So they just need something more steady. They might have kids. That's a dream killer. Sorry. Um, but <laughs> there are people who work it out, but <laughs> yeah, um, it's hard. So you know, I think success is, it has to be because the other thing too, in my business is that everything is beyond my control. I can't control that there was a COVID pandemic. I had a 23 city 30 date tour planned for May and June. It was going to be basically what I'm saying, like touring artists, like that was going to be like a major step towards that being it, you know, that's, was going to be what I was going to do. And the whole thing was canceled for in a show that I, we will never do live. We've never, we are, we had a dress rehearsal on March 14th for the show that was canceled. We've never done this show live. We've only done it in all the way through with tech. Everything was canceled. So I cannot control anything. And then and this is just like, you know, world events, not to mention like, I can't control, like if it rains on a night, and the show is packed when a reviewer is there. I can't control if like someone doesn't like the book or doesn't like me. I can't control so much. Like if I, I have lost roles because of the color of my hair, did it match the furniture? Like <laughs> life is completely out of my control and in what I do. And so then how do you define the success? And, and for me, I think it just has to be like the success is the fact that I get up to do and do this every day. Because if I make it anything else, it's just a, setting myself up for misery. 
you know, it's, and it's not to say that I'm like some Buddha and I'm just like, I do it every day and I feel great. Uh, I feel shitty all the time. Okay. <laughs> all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, what about any, uh, any regrets along the way? Um, Oh, oh yes, definitely. I don't like regrets, but I would just say, and this is what I say to anyone starting probably in anything, but I'm going to say this for show business and you can apply it to your realm of life is that do the thing that you set out to do. And you have an original, let's just say micro on a project. And also this applies to your career micro in a project, you know what, like you, you're this initial spark. Like when I started my Greta Garbo play, I was like, it was a comedy. The first reading, everyone was laughing. It was absurd. Greta Garbo was like this crazy old lady. And then I got influenced by people who had this idea that it had to be serious drama. And it, people loved it still. And people tell me, don't say that, but I feel like it, it shit on the project. And, I, and people are like, you need to rewrite it as an absurd play at a certain comedy. And like, maybe that will happen. Maybe I will become the crazy old lady. And then I will, when I'm like 70, rewrite the play and do it age appropriately. But, um, but I think I lost, I didn't, I knew you're the creator. You're the boss. Everyone else is replaceable. If they don't see, if they do not align with your vision and they do not believe in you, especially that they don't believe in you, they need to go. They might be talented. They might be well-connected, but if they don't get it, there's no point. There's it's no just point. like a, it's just like a startup. I mean, you got to believe in it. You got to believe in the product um, and the service and what you're doing. Uh, Cause it's not easy. <laughs> um, what about like looking back, okay, going back to high school or whatever it was, like any advice you would give yourself looking back, maybe your 16 year old self? Hmm. Uh, I would say to be really proud of being different. That is, it breaks my heart when I see people who felt like I did and my friend's son is having trouble because he feels like he's different and, and why can't I be like everyone else? And I'd say, oh my God, baby. You're not like everyone else. Yay. That's all. We, that's what we all want now. As soon as the older you get, the more different you want to be. <laughs> yeah. Yes, totally. Totally. And it's just to be like, be really proud of being weird and different. So uh, let's circle back around to the book a little bit. So how has that been going? Like with COVID? I know obviously your tour would have been a big hit to, 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 to push the book, but I also think that COVID and maybe perhaps you you were already um, doing great on social media and, and pushing out all that content, but has that helped a little bit with the with the with COVID and pushing content, or you know how has it been going? Um, any you know there's any trials or tribulations going on with the book release? Well, what COVID did is it gave me time to focus a little more on online platform in like a very focused way because there's nothing else to do, so. <laughs> That was helpful. And I felt like I learned, I've been learning a lot because it's still, things aren't open. So I'm still kind of in that same position. So it's been helpful. Like we were able to explore TikTok. We would have never had that time because it's a whole other thing. So that's been helpful in terms of expanding and understanding the, the environment of social media a lot more and what people are doing to get followers and how it all really goes down was really, really has been really helpful in, un in understanding. So that's uh, like a positive. Um, I think marketing books in person is very powerful and is something this book has missed. Um, however, doing, we've done like online shows for bookstores that I would never, that there were some bookstores that said no. And because we said, Hey, I'll come in and I'll do a show for you guys, an online show for free. Um, it's called, we'll do the Melania Trump road show for you. And the Melania Trump road show, get out the vote and get me out of the white house of garbage. Uh, so we'll do an online version of that and try to like sell some books that way. And these bookstores said no, but then they said yes to the show because they're like scrambling to try to get some momentum. And so now I have relationships with those booksellers that I didn't have before. I think it's like three more stores that wouldn't have had. And it's really hard to get into, but I don't know if anyone knows this. It's really hard to get into a bookstore. And now I personally know a bunch of booksellers that I wouldn't have known otherwise. So, 
and then they know other booksellers. So it's just, it's all, it's very helpful. Like one hand washes the other with that. So, um, that's, that's an example of something positive that's happened. Also, I would have never had time for Amazon ads. That's something I'm going, I don't know yet to be decided how successful that will be. We actually do not publish on Amazon, the paper book. Uh, because you can go get the book at InsideMelania.com. We're going to experiment with ads and then putting it available on Amazon print um, and seeing if we get to maybe make a better profit margin if we sell more. We'll see that way. So Yeah, definitely. I noticed the, the Kindle editions on Amazon and obviously and, um, and on Audible as well. Yes. Um, so, but you know, those books, I always love those kind of books that are in print. I, I am a big Kindle reader, but I do like a book that you could just open up and read it for a minute and then put it back down. I don't do that with the Kindle so, so well. Uh, I'll yeah. read it front to back as opposed to just jump around a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so was Melania Trump only a model? <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? I do, I do the model. I, I model, I model lingerie in many circumstances. So. <laughs> you mentioned TikTok. Is there any, is there a bit that you're working on with that? With, uh, you know, obviously that's Trump's kind of battle with TikTok. Uh, is is I, anything working there? I did do, I did do a video that was like Melania going, Donald, your hair plugs look so full today. Don't delete TikTok. <laughs> No, no, your spray tan looks so even. Don't delete TikTok. So I just, <laughs> we did. Oh, that, yeah. I love all that stuff. Um, so I, I guess this is my last question. I always end the, the podcast this way and, um, and you can take it any way you wish, but how would you like to be remembered? Mm. Uh, I mean, w the way every comedian wants to is that I made people laugh and feel good. Well, I love it. Lauren, it was a super pleasure to have you on the Establishing Your Empire podcast. I really appreciate, appreciate your time. Um, it's an awesome book, Inside Melania, available Thank a lot you. of different places. Uh, there'll be a ton of links below and uh, check it out. Thank you. All right, cheers. <laughs>